Welcome to the AFA Warfare Symposium. Our panel is called Building an Even Stronger Air and Space Force by Improving Diversity and Inclusion. We're gonna focus our discussion today on a recently released IG report on racial disparity in the force. The review was released in December and it was requested following some concerns about the application of military justice, but soon the scope expanded and included much, much more. Areas such as administrative separation, PME, promotion, career placement, and more. This was really a monumental effort to get at data and personal experiences of airmen and to get at some of the uh, concerns we have about potential disparities in the force. I have some statistics, just a few to share that I think really capture the breadth of the input from airmen. It's really quite impressive. 123,000 survey responses, 27,000 pages of written feedback, 338 hotline calls and emails. This is really, really impressive. So we're gonna hear from our panel today uh, about what senior leaders are going to do with the results. There's already some additional investigation to try to get at root cause. But we already know that treating people differently is just plain wrong from a human perspective, but it actually has operational impact as well. If we're limiting or holding back a certain percentage of our airmen from achieving the mission, it has real operational impact. So I'm gonna quote one uh, major from the A1 team, uh, Major Katie Coots, who said, the A1 team is comfortable having uncomfortable conversations. So panel, let's see if we can have the uncomfortable conversation and hopefully make it a comfortable discussion. I'm gonna introduce the panel. I'm gonna ask each of you to uh, say your title, but also if you'd like to make a intro comment about the subject, uh, we'd welcome that comment. I'm gonna kick it off with General Larry Spencer. Larry? Well, thank you, Lisa, and I'm really happy to be here. And I, I first want to thank the Air Force Association for taking on this topic, because you're right, it, it can be an uncomfortable topic, but it shouldn't be. So I commend AFA for taking this on. Um, again, I'm Larry Spencer, my Air Force background. I was the uh, started out enlisted uh, and retired as the uh, 37th uh, Vice Chief of Staff of the Air Force. I'm currently the president of the Armed Forces Benefit Association and the Five Star Life Insurance Company. So I'm really looking forward to the discussion today. I know we've got a panel of, of great folks here who are very steeped in the subtopic. So really looking forward to jumping into this. Great, thank you. Lieutenant General B.K. Kelly. Yeah, thanks, Ms. Disbro. It's, uh, it's Lieutenant General uh, B.K. Kelly. So I'm the Deputy Chief of Staff for Manpower Personnel and Services, our Air Force A1. Uh, and uh, as General Spencer said, I do want to thank uh, AFA for taking on this subject. Uh, the quote that you put out there, I think, is the right quote, right, is we need to be comfortable with uncomfortable topics. And I would say uh, in this area of diversity and inclusion, uh, too often in the past, people have focused on what it's not. And usually you get an emotional response and people think uh, we're trying to advantage or disadvantage somebody or, or do uh, affirmative action or give somebody a leg up. Uh, when in fact, as you as you noted, right, this is really about national uh, defense strategy and war fighting, right? It's about maximizing the potential of all of our talent base, everybody that we have in our force so that we can, no kidding, uh, get after what is an ever more complex kind of environment. The only way for us to do that is to look at the talent across the country, uh, you know, in an all volunteer force and make sure that we're an employer of choice going forward. So that's what we're focused on. And that's why uh, I think the RDR, the report that's there really helps us get after that. Uh, but allows us to stay focused on that operational aspect. And that's what you'll see us talk about and hear about from us. So thanks. Great. Pat, okay. Thanks, Ms. Disbro. And I would like to also thank AFA for uh, hosting uh, today's conversation. It is so incredibly important that we do this. Um, I'm the first uh, S1 for the United States Space Force. And I just want to also echo both um, General Spencer and General Kelly's comments about this is a national security issue. And it matters that we look like, that our leadership reflects, and we attract new members from across our rich and diverse uh, America. So I'm, I'm really excited about getting a chance to participate today. Thank you. And as a fellow civilian, I want to mention, because you didn't, aren't you retired Army Colonel? I am. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Thank you for your service. And Tawanda Rooney. 
Yes, Ms. Disbro and General Spencer, first I wanna thank you all for being here today uh, for your great leadership and commitment to diversity and inclusion. As you all talked about this tough time and um, you know, at the heels of what's happening in our country, I thank you for your service and your leadership to the Air Force. Um, I am Tawanda Rooney, the director for the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. Actually, the stand-up of the office was January the 11th. I came on board, so I am a newbie um, to the Department of the Air Force in this role. And I really, really look forward to, I like the theme from AFA and thank them for the topic of diversity and equity. The theme of building an ever stronger aerospace force is very timely um, as Lieutenant General Kelly and Ms. McKay coming from the Air Force and the Space Force really look forward to this discussion and the topic. Thank you. And as a fellow civilian Tawanda, I'd like to mention you're a senior executive of the Intelligence Service, correct? That's correct, yes ma'am. Our titles don't reflect um, the accomplishments, so I want to make a note of that. Thank you. Thank you. Great. So let's start with you, General Spencer. As a retired senior leader of the Air Force, you certainly watched with interest and concern the um, riots and demonstrations last summer. I wondered if you'd share with us um, your thoughts um, and or actions uh, through the summer and fall as you watch those events unfold. Well, yeah, uh, thank you. A couple of, couple of comments. Uh, one is um, similar to the uh, Air Force uh, study on, on racial inequality or inequities, um, I guess I was surprised that others were surprised by the outcome. Uh, in, in other words, uh, it, it was horrific uh, to watch what happened uh, to George Floyd. Um, but for those to now all of a sudden be surprised that there are, uh, although it happens to women as well, but in particularly uh, 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 black males that were being killed. And I'm, uh, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm pro, pro uh, uh, law enforcement. So this is not a, uh, an indictment against law enforcement overall, but the, the fact that there were young uh, black men in particular being killed, unarmed black men, should not have been a surprise um, because it's been happening for some time. And I was not surprised by the, uh, the results of the Air Force uh, analysis that showed uh, some pretty uh, disparaging numbers, you know, uh, between uh, airmen of color and, and others with regard to court martials, with regard to Article 15s, with regards to failure to go. I mean, it, it was across the board. So I don't, and, and in fact, uh, these studies have been taking place in the Air Force and in the military for years. Uh, as far back as the early 70s, following the, uh, there was a, a quote unquote race riot, if you will, out of Travis uh, that led to a study. Uh, and we've been <laughs> having these studies periodically throughout our history. Uh, but the question is, or at least for me, the challenge is, okay, we know what the information says, but number one, why, is, why are the numbers the way they are? And then two, what do we do about it? Um, you know, there's some interesting things in the study. For example, uh, the study points out that more minorities tend to go into non-operational career fields. Uh, okay, I don't assume there's anything nefarious there, but, but, but why is that? And if once we find out why that is, then what do we do about it? Uh, I think that's kind of what I'm hoping will happen from, for, uh, from this point forward, that now we'll focus on root causes uh, and we'll focus on uh, on an action plan that will be part of our DNA. You know, we, we occasionally get commanders in, uh, A1s in, uh, secretaries in, chiefs in that are interested in the topic. It gets a lot of fanfare, they leave, and then we kind of just settle back to where we were. Uh, how do we get this institutionalized so that five or 10 years from now, you know, we won't have a panel like this. Uh, and when we do a study, the numbers will look different. Um, so that's what I'm, I'm really hoping uh, that this will lead to. And I think it's really important to understand that the military is just a reflection of our society. So, uh, you know, folks, folks don't leave their home, go to basic military training and pop out in six weeks later, a different person. You know, we all bring in different uh, experiences, different life lenses. Um, and, and that's something that we have to deal with. We don't like to talk about it, as we said earlier, but we have to talk about it. To give you a quick example, I mean, as, as Tawanda Rooney, 
uh, I was born in uh, Southeast DC. Um, my neighborhood was 100% black. My school was 100% black. My church was 100% black. So I came into the military with very little experience with other cultures. Um, and, and I was not unusual. So as folks come into the military, we tend to ignore that folks, you know, that people have different views uh, and we don't really like to talk about, you know, how do we make all that work together? Because as you pointed out, the real issue is combat capability and, and trust and mutual respect. And how do we build that so that we have the highest level of combat uh, capability that we can have? So again, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Uh, I know we've got great folks in the, uh, in the Air Force focused on this. Uh, and I'm looking forward to sort of taking that next step uh, so we can, we can really get at the cause and really get at some solutions. Thank you. Um, my, my next question concerns, you know, the point that you made that there have been multiple studies uh, over the years um, and the changes, the necessary changes haven't really stuck um, because we are, here we are 2021 having this discussion. So I'll ask first, Pat, if you'd make a comment on what areas, I know that the report is just newly out and there's these root cause investigations underway and other actions, but would you just give some thought on what you think uh, the, 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 most, uh, the most effective changes would be coming out of this? Yeah, no, thanks, Ms. Disbro. I, I, th I, th I think you got to go on a couple of different fronts. So um, to General Spencer's comment about getting after um, what skills or specialties or areas folks are interested in, um, because um, we'll promote at the end those who are typically in the operational career fields, right? So you need to start out at that level and be interested in that. I would say from a perspective of the Space Force, um, we um, have mostly technical skills, right? So we're operators, Intel, cyber, engineers, um, and, and systems acquisition folks. Um, so, uh, so we already feel the challenge of um, that tends to not be as, as diverse a group that are coming in um, from high schools and from, and, uh, from colleges. So uh, what we have set out doing from the onset is seeing where we should be establishing some university partnerships uh, to partner with particular universities that have the STEM degrees that we're looking for, plus our um, connected to more diverse talent too. Uh, one that we started right off the bat was with North Carolina A&T uh, because of the um, really good uh, engineer program that they have um, and very focused on, uh, on African Americans. Um, and so, uh, so, so these are some of the things we think that we need to do more of from the, the beginning. And then towards the, the middle of the career, um, we see more of a focus on, on and I know that we've been saying this uh, for, for, for years now, coaching and mentoring, and certainly um, lots of folks do it um, and feel very strongly about it as a, a representative of good leadership. But in the Space Force, just two years ago, we started to do a more formal program for our 06s, and all of the 06s were part of this coaching program. Really good feedback, and right off the bat was, and why are we doing it this late um, in a career? So we think coaching and mentoring is really important to be doing um, earlier, earlier on in a career. And then that gets you to training as well. In our pre-command training, we're now doing it with both um, the officers and, the, uh, and our senior NCOs, um, as well as we've introduced um, quite a bit of uh, diversity and inclusion discussions. And back to something General Kelly said earlier, and how we deal with uncomfortable conversations and, and uh, unconscious bias. So those are a couple of things that we're thinking about um, as we are uh, establishing the Space Force. And I'm reminded a good portion of our force is coming from our sister service services from the Air Force. So we are definitely in this together. Great, thank you. Tawanda? Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. And um, certainly I echo um, a lot of the sentiments that have been said, but I wanted to step back a little bit and talk about, you know, what are we gonna do so that we can have the most impact to get after um, some of the issues coming out. So as you all recall, last fall or last June, the Department of the Air Force, we stood up a diversity and inclusion task force 
to meet immediately uh, address some of the issues of racial, ethnic, and uh, gender disparities. And that report um, that started the in, uh, Inspector General report on racial disparities coming at the heels of the George Floyd's death. Um, and that task force at the time was charged to address some immediate diversity issues like taking action on providing ROTC scholarships to historically black colleges and universities, revising some dress appearance regulations, created strategic relationships with African-American sororities and fraternities, as well as Congressional Hispa Hispanic Caucus Institutes, really to get after and engage with those students in, the, in that particular demographic. But as you know, that was just a start. But I think the biggest impact that we are um, we have now is standing up this office, my office on diversity, diversity and inclusion under the Secretary of the Air Force, making this a leadership priority. Um, the office will oversee these diversity and inclusion initiatives. Um, Ms. Mulcahy talked about the efforts that's undergoing under the space. General Kelly will talk about what's happening in the Air Force, reviewing those policies and regulations that are preventing or providing barriers to get after. Um, so we're going to be doing that. And one of the most important thing is, as we've talked about to date, is really tracking those results. How are we doing and how are we keeping up with that across both services? But we're using that framework um, from the task force as well as the IG report as a preliminary roadmap to, to kind of shape the foundation um, that we're moving forward with. Um, we have a three-pronged approach that we're looking at. How do you get after improving culture? How do you expand diversity and how do we measure those results? And as we've talked about it, diversity and inclusion is vital to the Department of the Air Force. It's its competitive advantage and it's increasingly um, for complex global security environment as we talked about. And to maintain that innovative and technological advantage, we have to be able to attract talent from our communities, compete for those skills and provide um, professionals that are committed to our nation. So I think we're getting after that in the ODI office and, and look forward to further conversation on this. Thanks. That sounds really good. Thank you. And uh, General Kelly, will you comment on the same question? And it's been a little while since I asked it, so I'll, I'll ask it again briefly. Um, the areas you think are going to be the most important or the most effective to get at this issue. Yeah, thanks, Ms. Disbro. Uh, and um, let me start with uh, what General Spencer started with a little bit in that. Um, so for some of us, um, the data and the findings weren't weren't surprising, right? Um, but the fact that we have had all these efforts over the years, uh, frankly, is a little frustrating, right? That, that we all have to admit that. And we also have to admit, I think, um, that if we're not careful this time, we could have the same same outcomes. We could have all these good, well-intended actions uh, not result in, in, in moving forward. And so one of the things we spent some time on is, um, what do we need to do differently and what are the important things to do differently so these things stick and we go forward? Uh, and you heard General Spencer mention institutionalizing. And um, one of the things that we think about is um, there's three parts of, of this for us and, and we, have to, we have to sort of synchronize those three parts. Uh, we got to work on the culture and make sure the culture is there. Like, so we would say sometimes in the past we've made changes, but the culture wasn't accepting of the changes, right? So uh, when, when individuals left or individuals moved on, the culture never changed. Uh, and it just reverted back to where it was before. So that's important. The second part for us is understanding those barriers that everybody was talking about, the barrier analysis. And then the last part, and I'm gonna focus on this, is um, the processes, the processes that we put in place have to incentivize uh, and move us in the, in the culture change that we want, right? So what we're thinking about is, how do we make sure when we identify barriers and problems and we're going to make a process change in talent management, um, how do we make sure the change that we make in that talent management process is reinforcing and incentivizes the behavior that we want? And I'll give you an example. Now, we just launched something we call the Airman Leadership Qualities, these 10 qualities that we think are really important uh, for, for our airmen to have in the future. And uh, I know Ms. Mulcahy is working on similar things in the Space Force. Uh, but what, what are the attributes that we think are going to be most important in a high-end fight in the future? Back to that strategic imperative. Among those... Um, not coincidentally, not accidentally, is one that says inclusion and teamwork is really important and that a leader has to have the ability uh, to build, nurture, and develop an inclusive environment around so that everybody's ideas can be contributed uh, and everybody's ideas can be valued. The fact that we've put this into now, put this into our talent management system, right now it's for feedback and, and discussing that, but it's going to be incorporated into our officer and enlisted performance management system. So the OPRs and EPRs are going to have a factor on there. 
uh, that talks about your ability as a leader to be inclusive and to nurture and build inclusive teams. Um, so we are indicating to the force and we're reinforcing and incentivizing to the force the fact that we want to have this inclusive culture. And if you as a leader um, don't have that skill set, right, you're not going to move us move forward, right? Until you can develop that skill set, we're, we're indicating that that is an important part of the 10 most important attributes, if you will, uh, for a future airman to have. So it's that kind of understanding of how we tie these things together and make sure that our processes reinforce the culture change that we want. So the culture change, you know, which takes time, builds and builds momentum and isn't allowed to sort of backslide or go the other way. And so as we look at each of these barriers and identify whatever it happens to be in the area of promotions or development, we're trying to make sure that we are putting something in place that is going to incentivize and drive the culture for long term uh, you know, uh, processes and institutionalizing those things like General Spencer said, so that we don't miss the opportunity that's probably been missed in the past to actually incentivize and drive the changes we're looking for. So that's really what I think is one of the big important takeaways for us uh, and where we're frankly focused on being different than how we've approached this problem in the past. So let's uh, carry on that theme of the culture. And I'm going to ask General Spencer, um, you know, you had however many, almost four decades in, of service uh, yourself, you experience the, well, we all experience the culture, right? Um, but what insights could you share with us about what you think would help change that culture? Or, you know, maybe something, an experience you had where if you went back, you'd, you'd you know, you'd either you'd do it differently or you'd make sure your commander did it differently. Well, you know, I think, uh, first, the, the Air Force is very good about fixing problems. Uh, and, and in this case, I must, uh, I'm applying that to the Space Force as well. Fixing problems when they acknowledge they have one. Uh, and so I, I think it's important to, we have to really baseline ourselves and admit that we have a problem. That, that's number one. Uh, and, and part of that admission is, again, recognizing that you know, one of the things that makes this country so great is, is our, our diverse, the diverse population we have and, and people are able to contribute from all sorts of backgrounds and talents. Um, and, but, under, but having those conversations and understanding that I think is really, really important. Uh, let me give you a quick example. When, as I told you, I, I mentioned I uh, started out enlisted and when I was uh, commissioned, uh, I was really looking forward to our first uh, social function as an, as an officer as part of the unit. And so we got the uh, uh, invitation uh, in the mail that said, you know, casual, you know, at the Oak Club. I said, hey, great. My wife and I were excited. We've never done this before. So fortunately, we lived on base because we, we came bopping out of the house, you know, in a pair of jeans because uh, we heard casual, which was casual for us, not recognizing that there was an unwritten Officer casual, you know, with the, <laughs> the dockers and the golf shirt. I mean, you, you know what it, you know what that uniform is, but no one had told us that. So fortunately, because we were on base, we could walk back home and change. Um, so now picture this: we we walk into the club where the only African Americans in the club, um, and so there is some amount of discomfort, but that's okay. You know that it's no different in the military. No, if I would have been an IBM, it would have been the same. Or so. But when we walk in, it's amazing the conversations we heard. Now, as I mentioned, I, I grew up in Southeast DC. There's a lot of things Southeast DC is known for, but golf courses is not one of them. Um, so I, I knew, not, I walk into this club and I'm hearing terms like uh, tee boxes and you know greens and roughs. Uh, and I had no idea what they were talking about. And I can't tell you the number of people that came up to me and asked me what my handicap was. And I had, I had no idea how to answer because I didn't know what they were talking about. <laughs> um, and and as, the day, as the evening progressed, the, and now look, and I have nothing whatsoever against country music, but I didn't grow up in DC hearing that genre. So the band cranks up uh, and folks around us are singing the songs and my wife and I are looking at each other and say, we, we, you know, we, we don't, we never heard these songs before. As the night progressed and the alcohol began to flow, uh, you know, conversations about politics. And, and my, my point is there was an assumption that because we were officers, one, we, we thought and believed and, and a, a certain way our recreational activities were the same. 
nothing wrong with that, except there was no understanding that this all may, this is all different for me. And I need, I'm trying to assimilate here into an organization that culturally is different than the one I was raised in. Uh, and so that happens every day. Uh, and it happened my entire career. Um, you know, and in most meetings, even in the Pentagon as a, as a four star, I would attend most meetings as the only African American in the room. Again, that, that's nothing, that's not bad necessarily, but there was no understanding that uh, that there was a that we came up differently. We see the world differently, uh, and we and, and we never talked about it. You know, we we just never talked about it. And I can't tell you, this is frustrating for my wife. I can't tell you the number of times we had we went to social functions, and it was assumed that she was part of the help, and and she got people asked her to go get them a drink. Uh, again, did, did she get mad at that? No, but you know, th these are things that we. I really wish we could have talked about. And what bothers me is the after the George Floyd incident, I had folks calling me from all over the country who I had worked with over my career, asking me, hey, are things really like that? And, and the thought I ha had was two. One is, boy, I wish you'd asked me that you know, years ago uh, and we could have had a good conversation about it. Because look, there's a lot I need to learn too. So this is two way, this is not one way. Um, and the other thing I worry about though, the farther we get away from George Floyd, the less you hear about it. And that's what bothers me. And that's where I hope that, uh, that General Kelly is gonna change because the farther we get away from this Air Force study, the, 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 the more people will start to forget about it and we won't have those tough conversations anymore. So yeah, it, uh, uh, the Air Force has a great culture. Uh, it's a great way of life, but I think it's important that all leadership recognize that the folks coming in through pouring in through basic training every every couple of weeks graduating they come they got all kinds of backgrounds and, and different thoughts about things and if we don't get them together and have them start talking about their differences the way they see things how did they respond to the george floyd uh issue uh i think is important uh, i've gone over my a lot of time but let me mention one thing because i certainly don't want to get into politics here but I, I think it's important that we, as we work with our airmen, we let them, we make sure they understand as much as our, our society tries to make these issues binary, they are not. For example, can you can support Black Lives Matter and you can support our law enforcement at the same time. It, it, we, 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 our society is trying to make us pick sides. We have to resist that. Uh, and I, I think that's that's one of the elephants in the room. You either believe in one or the other. No, you don't. I, I support both. Uh, I, I'm very supportive of our law enforcement. I don't believe in defunding police, as an example. But I also understand that there's a issue going on in the black community with policing that we need to address. I think you can you can agree with both. So, uh, again, I, I've, I've gone over my lot of time. But but yeah, this I'm really excited about this because I, I know uh, those of you who don't know, I've known General Kelly for a while, so I, I know he's the right guy for this task. Uh, and so I'm really excited about, uh, and I'm, I'm excited to see that he he was smart enough to pick Tawanda to, to help him. So we've got the right team in place, uh, and I'm really excited to see this move forward. Tawanda, would you uh, provide some thoughts on the culture, uh, changing culture from your perspective, from your office's perspective? How do we get at it? Yeah, I, I mean, I appreciate um, uh, General Spencer, and certainly we have similar upbringings um, in terms of where we grew up, especially um, in the culture that we have. Uh, and, and I think it's important to have those tough conversations. I too have come in the room and, um, and, and I was sharing in a previous conversation, uh, was sitting on a board and um, one of the senior executives in the room and someone else came in the room and thought I was, you know, the executive secretary. and. Um, and so we get those kind of, um, but I think in order for us to have that culture and, and talk about that, we actually have to have, <clears throat> excuse me, more of us in the room. And so where we assimilate very well, um, I, I think we gotta get more people in that conversation and, and to be able to have those tough conversations. Because if not, then it becomes the, the uh, General Spencer and Ms. Rooney and it's hard to really have those conversations if the majority of culture is different. Um, and so I think we need to do that. 
the other thing we're getting after is, um, uh, to your point, is having the conversation. I think it's a leadership conversation. I think the timing is correct. Um, of course, the George Floyd made it, highlighted it more. Um, and we're really getting after trying to put it together under the Secretary of the Air Force, making this a leadership priority. And as General Spencer talked about, having General Kelly and Ms. McKay um, together to really try to get to the root cause analysis that's coming out of that report. My office in particular is really looking at putting together that three-prong approach that we just talked about, really getting at the culture piece. How do we define efforts to really get after the culture? There were things that came out of the 15 recommendation that came out of the Diversity and Inclusion Board from OSD. A lot of those things we can tuck under there and actually move forward to deal with culture issues. The other piece is how do we increase those numbers for diversity? We know this is gonna be a long game. So it's not gonna be a quick fix, but we're gonna be getting after those as well. And I think identifying those as we roll out from the diversity and inclusion um, board recommendations, as well as the um, racial diversity um, review report. Um, but my office is, is really looking at those policies. We're looking at those regulations. We're looking at those barriers to really get after. One of the things that I uh, highlighted here is that uh, General Webb is doing a fantastic job down at AETC. He's having a commander's talk on racial and disparity. He's getting the audience together, not just from African Americans, but he's bringing an audience together, a diverse audience, to really get that talk going. And I think that's a good example of really being inclu in, uh, inclusivity as well as getting a diversity. Okay, great. General Kelly, um, what are some of the challenges to making these changes? Yeah, thanks, Ms. Disbro. You know, um, General Spencer, who, by the way, sir, I, I miss having those talks and, and listening to you. It's always, always great to hear all those perspectives. Uh, you know, um, admitting you have a problem was a start. And, and one thing I have to say for the secretary and the, and the service chiefs, you know, uh, General Goldfein before him, then General Brown and General Raymond, um, you know, we didn't have to do we didn't have to do a big IG review. In fact, um, you know, the other services, uh, not, I'm not the throwing throwing anything their way, but um, nobody else cho chose to do that. I, I would probably say similar results are going to come out from, from their review, right? Um, maybe a little bit different because the culture is a little different, but you're going to find very similar things across the Department of Defense, and that's what they found at the OSD board. Um, but I was proud of our Department of the Air Force for, for opening that up and saying, yes, we have a problem, and here's the problem. We're going we're gonna to openly confront it, right? Um, General Brown to go on and do his video uh, that he did when he was still the PACAF commander pr prior to him having confirmation, right? He hadn't, he hadn't had his confirmation hearing yet, and he went on and did that video. Um, just think about what, how, you know, how brave that was and what an example that set. So, um, you know, some of these things that have, have caused us to not move forward in the past, I'm, I'm emboldened. I'm, I'm excited that we're, we're doing some of those things. Um, the other thing I would say uh, that's going to come, come from this discussion is um, because we have this opportunity, you know, um, as General Spencer said, you know, we might forget the farther we get away from George Floyd, we might forget. But it's also opened up this opportunity, right? Um, we are, for the first time, in my opinion, holding ourselves more accountable than we did in the past. Um, um, you know, those uncomfortable conversations, folks who look like me are probably some of the most uncomfortable people, right? Our, our white males in, in our service um, tend, tend to sometimes be uncomfortable about this subject, right? That, that we think that this, the answer of these things is po poking at them or gonna poke at them. And that's not, that's not really the case, right? We've talked about what our real imperative is about the operational capability. Um, but as we go into these conversations and are able to, to do, no kidding, disciplined, um, you know, very disciplined root cause analysis so that we're not just swinging at ideas, um, we are going to uncover some things and be able to identify some things that I think will lead to long-term change uh, and long-term impact. Um, culture change isn't easy, but, uh, you know, the fact that the secretary, for instance, committed to Miss Rooney's office, committed to Tawanda's office and said, um, you know, despite the fact, that, and you remember when you were sitting up there, how many how many direct reports you already have, right, in, in that job, um, it was important enough to say we have to have a direct report office to the Secretary of the Air Force that is going to be there to be accountable and review these things all the time, and it's going to uh, endure uh, from from administration to administration as we go for, we go forward. Um, these are indications and things to me that that the, the changes that we're trying to make uh, and the path that we're on. Um, has a much better chance for success than we've had in the past. Um, I'm, I'm not going to 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 uh, lose sight of, as General Spencer said, this has been tried a bunch of times before, uh, and it's never been, you know, because it wasn't well-meaning. But we, I think, have a unique opportunity now, given everything that happened in the country 
uh, given where we are, given the resources that we have uh, to really make some lasting changes and do some things that will change the culture. Uh, and when the culture changes and we can reinforce the culture with the other processes and things we can put in, I think the measurements that Tawanda's talk about um, will start to show start to show some benefit. It'll be over time. It won't be instant. Um, some of the things that we'll do will take years to to, uh, to manifest. Others will be uh, closer to the to the start. But I think there's some real real positives and some opportunity here, and we need to take advantage of it. And and frankly, if we don't, you know, shame on us if we don't do that. So so really really excited about what our opportunities are. Thanks, Pat. Do you, you see the same challenges in the Space Force? I do. I wanted to comment on um, with with all that has been going on this past year, um, as we are setting out to um, establish our identity and, and our culture. Um, you know, a good reason why we were established is because of uh, of the uh, dangers in space and, and the fact that um, it's it's a contested environment, and so we need to build that warfighter culture that goes um, right in tandem with why we have to be diverse and inclusive. Um, and so, um, so General Raymond, and I'd like to pick up again on what General Spencer said about owning the problem. I mean, General Raymond has felt very strongly since uh, uh, about owning this issue as well. And we've had um, some uh, hard discussions about um, values and culture and uh, included uh, some of the, as I like to say, the youngsters. And, um, and, and, and they want to see the improvements and they want to see us uh, um, stay connected. Um, so, uh, so, we, so we have some challenges in front of us. Um, and, and there's just, I have to say, I know General Spencer, we've been at this before, but there is no time like the present. And, uh, and I appreciate, um, I mean, it's a, it's a big Air Force, Space Force, but I appreciate uh, working across uh, with my colleagues in General Kelly and then uh, uh, Ms. Rooney as well. Thanks. Tawanda, we've been talking today and focused today on racial disparity and this excellent report that was recently released, but your office has a broader scope. Um, is there a priority on race per se, or could you talk a little bit about how you're prioritizing across the various aspects of DNI? Thanks for that question. Um, <clears throat> we're really getting after the whole, and um, as you know, diversity and inclusion is not just talking about demographics, um, we're, we're talking about across it all. We're talking about skill sets. We're talking about getting after gender. We're talking about uh, across the board so that as we talked about, this is going to be a warfighter imperative. Um, and so as I've laid out our three-prong approach is really to um, you know, admit that we have a problem, get after the racial disparity um, review, attack that, look at those DNI 15 recommendations, but look at a strategic framework to improve that culture, to really get after, how are we gonna get after diversity? How are we gonna look at the um, managing and um, tracking those results? One of the big things for me is to really lay out that foundation so that we can get it rooted into getting back to General Spencer's point about institutionalizing. I think it's great to actually go after some immediate actions, but if we cannot root it in terms of uh, going across the Department of the Air Force, then we're just going to be back to the beginning. So I think the, the biggest thing for us is to put that institutional plan together to really identify those things that are going to root it into the culture, those things that are going to really increase uh, diversity and, and really measure and monitor and track. I think the, big, the last prong there is to go back and track. So when we look at the racial disparity report and what's coming out there with those findings, how are we tracking it over time? We have a checkpoint to come back in six months to say, okay, here's the report. Then we have another annual report. We're gonna be looking at those root cause analysis and really getting after them. And so I think that's what's really gonna be different for us. And I think that's really what's gonna make the difference. We have the leadership buy-in. We have it at the top of, of, of the Secretary of the Air Force's priority. We certainly have it coming out of DOD and we certainly have the executive orders coming out the White House. So I think the timing is right. We just need to now make sure that we actually have a strategic framework to root it within the Department of the Air Force. Yeah, I really agree. And I, I'm excited to see the senior leadership all the way, Secretary of Defense, the White House, um, of course, certainly General Raymond and General Brown, it's, it really is, and all of you have pointed that out. But I'm also really, really excited about this conversation today. You all, you know, your passion came through. You're all not just talking, you can tell you, you're really serious about uh, taking some action and moving this. 
um, and improving. And the Air Force has changed, you know, as a, as a female in the early 80s on active duty, I saw a huge culture change um, just in the way the professionaliz professionalization of people in, um, in different situations based on a lot of the initiatives that were undertaken back then. So I do believe this change can happen. And I'm really excited to hear that the young airmen are, are actually leaning into it as well. Um, thanks very much for all of your participation today. And what I'd like to do is we have just about five minutes. Um, I'd like to kind of call you by name again and give you an opportunity to close this out. If you have a final message you'd like to, um, to share with the audience, please take, uh, take time to do that. Let's start with you, General Spencer. Okay, well, thank you again, uh, Lisa uh, and uh, AFA. Uh, it's, it's really a great, uh, uh, a great panel uh, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity to participate. Um, let me close by saying, uh, when I retired uh, from the Air Force, my sec second to last day, um, I walked out in the hallway, as you all have done, and just coincidentally, I looked at the pictures of the chief of staff, chiefs of staffs of the Air Force and the secretaries. And, and it, maybe, it, I don't know if I, why I didn't notice it before, but I noticed there, there's no one of color uh, in any of those pictures. Uh, and, and that's after being in the Air Force for over 40 years. Um, I remember when I, when I enlisted in the Air Force, there hadn't been no one of color had reached the greater four star in any military service. That's during my service. Uh, I only point that out because a lot of times when people hear that, they, they then view these efforts as subtraction. In other words, we're moving forward to try to make sure everyone has uh, an equal opportunity uh, and a fair shot. And that means taking away from something else. And, and, and that's not what this is about. This is about inclusion, not subtraction. Uh, and, and I think, unfortunately, some folks uh, feel threatened by this conversation because they think that, that it means there will be less opportunities for others uh, if we are successful uh, going forward. So that is certainly not the case. It's about inclusion. Uh, and it, at the end of the day, it's about a stronger uh, Air Force. It's about combat and a stronger Space Force. And it's about combat capability. That, that's all this is about, uh, getting the best talent through the system up to the, our leadership. That's all it's about. So again, thank you. I uh, appreciate uh, working with all of you all on this panel and, and I look forward to watching the progress uh, from outside of the Pentagon. Excellent, thank you. Tawanda. Hey, certainly this has been a joy to, um, to have this conversation and um, it's just grow and, and General Spencer, thank you again. Um, but I'll leave you with this. I think we, we've talked about our commitment. Certainly there's a lot of work to be done, but I think we have made the first step um, necessary to elevate not only this conversation, but to elevate this office of diversity and um, inclusion under the Secretary of the Air Force. So again, a priority for leadership. Um, and I think it's just important as you have indicated that is a warfighter imperative. It's important for us to get the best ta talent to make sure that we're representative of what our citizens are in the United States. And so we're committed to that. But there's a recurring um, quote that I keep coming after, uh, you know, as I read up on diversity and inclusion, and it's by Vernon Myers. It says, diversity is being invited to the party. Inclusion is being asked to dance. And, and the goal to, for us in the Department of the Air Force is make sure that we send the invitation to all. And those who accept, ensure they get an opportunity to dance. Thank you. Thanks, Tawanda. I don't recall dancing when I was on active duty, but uh, I like the I like the visual. Thanks. <laughs> the first civilian S one hat. Thanks, Ms. Disbro. Thanks, uh, General Spencer, um, for your uh, participation and leadership today and to AFA. And I want to say as the youngest and newest service uh, on the block, um, I, as uh, sobering as this past year has been, um, it really is encouraging that we have a great opportunity. And uh, with the support of the, the Secretary and General Raymond, um, uh, we're going to move forward on this one. I, I would also say that um, in particular, as we're building the service, um, we have been um, especially looking at diversity and able with uh, so many volunteers that want to come over from the Air Force to make sure that that's part of what we're looking at. Um, and so, uh, uh, so we're excited. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. Okay, General Kelly, bring us home. 
Okay, well, thanks, Ms. Disbro and General Spencer. And, and again, thanks to AFA. This, is, this has been a great, great uh, conversation. I appreciate being here with all our panel members as we're working on this really, really important topic. You know, I'm, I'm reminded that, um, you know, we're an all-volunteer force. Uh, and in an all-volunteer force, I think we have a moral obligation to maximize the, our ability to get talent from the country, right? Uh, if we have any, any, any um, barriers or any prohibitions to being able to maximize the talent that comes from an all-volunteer all force, then we fail the American people that we're there, we're there to serve. And so it's really an imperative for us. Um, and then I think about um, how, do, how do we know if we're successful in this area? And, and ultimately, I think um, when diversity and inclusion is interwoven into and is synchronized with everything we do, especially in the talent management areas and things that we do, and there's not an office of diversity and inclusion when Tawanda's office no longer exists, uh, because it's second nature to what we do, it's part of our fabric, it's part of our DNA and our culture, then we'll have been successful. That's how we'll know we've reached where we need to be uh, as a Department of the Air Force, and I look forward to that. So thanks again for letting me participate today. Hear, hear. Thanks very much, and thanks to all of you. Uh, a final thank you to the Air Force Association for hosting this panel, and um, thanks to all, and uh, get out there and get it done. <laughs> <laughs> thanks a lot.